Uh, once more, uh, uh, very good morning, everyone. Um, uh, welcome uh, to the participants in the ONA and welcome everybody online. I'm just going to inquire about the, the numbers today in the in the Zoom auditorium. Almost a hundred. Almost hundred. Okay, so uh, so it's uh, it's um, uh, very much tilted in favor of Zoom today, uh, <laughs> and uh, about twenty people in the ONA. I think this is very good because our uh, uh, lecture today is uh, Gokchigunel uh, anthropologists and. Uh, uh, a brilliant researcher uh, on energy that uh, has contributed now over over several years already uh, to to the discourse. Very exciting, and uh, uh, she speaks from uh, uh, Rice University today. Uh, so uh, about uh, six hours, I think, uh, <laughs> behind us. So. Uh, 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 let's say a very, very early morning session. Thank you so much, Gokcha, and we look forward to introduce you in a, in a moment. Uh, thank you to the team uh, this morning, Nazli uh, Tumerdam uh, and Kiana Zhu. And uh, I will uh, start by uh, saying that the, the session on, on energy for Gokcha and those of you who haven't uh, been uh, with us is uh, part of this lecture series. It's uh, it's a sort of a mini lecture series embedded in a in a wider series of talks on territory and urbanization, and we have um, in this manner, let's say, every every year by curating a kind of a, a thematic uh, lectures embedded within uh, the, the course on territorial design, we have addressed the different uh, sort of layers or constellations within territory. And those themes have been nature, my nature, my, my earth, my species, and so on, with very exciting uh, speakers over uh, the, the, these different semesters. And uh, with our guests and also with Gokche today, uh, we will work on an exercise. So we have worked on, on those exercises, which are graded for the students with different uh, techniques pertaining to landscape and territory. Here is one example of experimental affective cartography uh, introduced by Filip Rekacevic through his uh, uh, lecture uh, a few years ago. Another uh, interesting example by uh, introduced by Alexandra Aren, a landscape architect who is concerned with uh, representations that that capture um, the limits of the critical zone of the earth that uh, as as she defined it. So this is a kind of a anamorphosis of of the of the earth and earth inside out that the students were were drawing very fun and then a, a multi-species panorama uh, for example with with Fei Fei Zhu uh, last semester which also includes a kind of a historical timeline of of um, uh, development or or um, uh, uh, transformation or evolution of the landscape as as you as you move your your eye from from one side of the of the image to the other. So um, we have through these exercises we have um, uh, in a way opened the the uh, I would say also the the kind of co conversation around the grading and the pedagogy and also what is knowledge and kind of destabilized a little bit this sort of frontal <laughs> idea of exchange and knowledge reproduction included the guests in in also helping us define what is uh, interesting and what is topical and what is critical and also we will ask the guests to help then uh, also in um, let's say re reviewing your work or at least sort of going through it and, and giving a certain uh, uh, criteria or impressions that help in the grading so in this manner, we have obviously worked on, on, on shared concepts, shared 
common grounds, uh, common ethos, uh, and so on. So this is, of course, very, very important. We have done exercises in a physical form, but nowadays we do them, as you know, online <laughs> and through a, through a WhatsApp group. Uh, they are collected in this uh, in these unique collections uh, that you can see in our uh, uh, studio, and uh, you can access them. They are they are incredibly rich and kind of beautiful collections, and we we are working toward an exhibition in a, in a couple of years from now. So, in the honor of Gokche today, uh, two concepts proposed by her. Uh, grab your pencils and the first term <laughs> to deal with today is the post-oil urbanism and the second one is futurity not so uh, easy quite uh, abstract and very interesting so suggestion would be since most of you are online last names a to m post-oil urbanism and n to z futurity so we have about uh, uh, five minutes, and then we will uh, we will look at some contributions uh, through the through the WhatsApp exchange. Postal urbanism, of course, things will change a lot, but is it just about electric cars and bicycles, or or are there some other things to be said about it? <laughs> I think we will hear, of course, a lot from from Gokche. That's that's precisely the kind of warm up before her talk. So it would be it would be now the moment to actually begin sharing. This uh, futurity, the future state, has to do with the uh, with the uh, with the limits, Earth's limits. This was very much a kind of a club of Rome. Uh, let's say, understanding of the future. Great. Post-oil urbanism. Um, it's a lot about uh, el electric mobility um, <laughs> leading us to the future. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, I, I think there should be a little bit more to it, probably. Mm -hmm. Renewable energy, car-free cities. Uh -huh, no light after 22. It's also not a bad idea to kind of um, to rethink the, the, the impact of artificial light in our lives <laughs> and the lives of other beings on the earth. Mm -hmm. Further? Um, okay, I don't see the title. Uh -huh, this is also postal urbanism. There are there are a, a kind of a, a cable cable cars suspended between very very high towers, and there are also helicopters. I presume also uh, you know, electric uh, 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 battery powered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. Uh, all uh, all traffic is is fast underground. There are some electric cars, a kind of a, a kind of a Hilversheimer kind of vision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, great. I, I think this is these are green buildings. <laughs> By by Stefan. Hi Stefan. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I think this is we are questioning the the plastic. This is a very very good point. So the the production of petrochemical products is a huge part of uh, of oil consumption. By the way, it's not just the petrol. So this is a very very good point. So uh, uh, how shall we deal with that? Um, okay, maturity. Mm -hmm. 
fireplace is the heart of the home or a building. <laughs> well, I didn't think of that so far, but in a in a collective building, what would that be? Maybe an interesting project. Um, mm -hmm. Very simple, just some some more bicycles in Zurich. Nothing much changes in this future. Um, this is a futurity. Okay, very. Yeah. Maybe I don't understand it so far. Mm -hmm. Aha, uh -huh, no streets. So we will have these green strips and new parks in between buildings instead of streets. Great idea. <laughs> Futurity in, in harmony. Wonderful. And uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, beautiful uh, associations around it, even equal opportunity, respect, uh, no pollution, diversity, openness. A wonderful agenda. Thank you. Okay, postal urbanism again, let's say understood in terms of technological change. Okay. A lot of uh, uh, cargo bikes. <laughs> That's also a point. Uh, great. So this is uh, this is very fun. Unfortunately, we have to move forward. Uh, but uh, all all of your contributions that are that are very inspired this morning are uh, on our WhatsApp group, and you can check them out. Uh, again, hello to everyone, and uh, also to Gökçe. Uh, I will introduce her in a moment. Uh, so. But before, I would like to say a few words on uh, our team. Uh, so each year, as Milica mentioned, we have lecture series within the lecture series, territorial design, where we focus on a particular team and invite guests who give very inspiring talks on the subject. Uh, this year's theme is uh, my energy. And uh, I guess the timing couldn't be uh, more appropriate. Within this team, uh, this fall, we have four guest speakers engaged in fields ranging from energy humanities and feminist political ecology to urban history and urban design. Uh, their talks approach notions such as energy transition, decarbonization, genealogy of energy and urban microclimates. Uh, today, we are very pleased to welcome Gökçe as our second guest lecturer. Uh, and I would uh, start with a few words on the team. So energy is omnipresent, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere, and uh, we can say everything is related to energy. Uh, but if you think about it, what is it actually? Uh, it comes from Greek, uh, energeia, uh, of course, a term coined by Aristotle in the uh, 4th century BC, which can be described as being at work as all things are when they are real in the fullest sense. And uh, this connotation suggests uh, a positive but immaterial concept. Uh, but if we take a look at the historiography of science since the Industrial Revolution, we will see that this original meaning of the term has changed with the discovery uh, of energy, uh, discovery in air quotes, uh, in 1840s, its meaning transformed into a quantitative, a material property that can be measured. According to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to the other. It can be captured and capturing various forms of energy in order to ensure uh, a certain way of life uh, that serves to some at the expense of others has been business as usual for a very long time. But of course, this way of life, which we uh, have been taking for granted, was made possible through exploiting fossil fuels and treating the planet as a resource. The illusion of having ever more energy, cheap and inexhaustible for such a long time made energy inherent to our existence equivalent to a modern 
uh, normal life, to a free life. Uh, and today we are all the more aware of how delusional this is, being in the midst of a fossil fuel induced climate crisis interrelated with the pandemic and the ongoing geopolitical conflicts around the world, around the planet. It is very clear that certain things have to change uh, if we are to transcend the energy impasse that we are currently in. And now we are uh, feeling this also a lot in our daily lives, uh, having these regulations on how to uh, change our everyday lives by uh, making uh, certain adjustments, uh, getting these recommendations from uh, government. Uh, we are uh, most aware that we have ever been that these resources are finite uh, because it literally affects uh, us right now directly. The slogan of the federal government is energy is scarce, let's not waste it. So it's obvious that we must imagine alternative energy futures of post-oil, post-carbon, post-urban and post-human. Uh, like now you have done also a little bit in the exercise. In order to do that, we need epistemological and ontological changes within our habits, value systems, modes of living and institutions, and so on. But uh, we also have to question, can we really tackle the energy crisis and make the energy transition if we as citizens follow these recommendations? Uh, we now see that there is a big increase in purchase of Energy saving products, uh, this article published on Galaxus website shows that uh, maybe our obedience to these uh, recommendations coupled with uh, this uh, use of these gadgets will allow us to uh, go get through this winter, but uh, the question is what happens next. Considering all this, uh, reimagining the relationship between energy and territory through a critical ecological design thinking becomes all the more crucial. Instead of continuing the power asymmetries and allowing capitalism to reinvent itself by finding new frontiers of extraction and also uh, inventing new technofixes here and there, can the energy transition be radical and just? Or as we ask uh, in our design studio, power to the people, can architects and territorial designers envision a more democratic, equitable, and ecological energy landscape? Can we reconceptualize Aristotle's term energia once again and be at work collectively co to conceive energy as a public and planetary good that shapes <coughs> the socio-ecological fabric of our territories? So this is why we are very delighted to have here with us Gökçe Günel, who has a very interesting body of work on this subject. Gökçe is uh, Associate Professor in Anthropology at Rice University. Her first book, Spaceship in the Desert, Energy, Climate Change and Urban Design in Abu Dhabi, was published by Duke University Press in 2019 and focuses on the construction of renewable energy and clean technology infrastructures in the United Arab Emirates more specifically concentrating on the Master City project. Her articles have been published in Public Culture, Anthropological Quarterly, Environment and Planning, uh, Log Eflux and Every Review, among others. And prior to uh, RISE, she taught at Columbia University and University of Arizona. She is also co-leading uh, Patchwork Ethnography, a research and pedagogy project that seeks to challenge the ways ethnography is um, practiced and taught while offering methodological innovations. So in her talk today, Gökçe will discuss the construction of renewable energy and clean technology infrastructures and demonstrate how this fuels an aspiration in the area of peak oil for the manageability of ecological problems through techno fixes without ever surrendering, slowing down, or giving up on productivity and technological <coughs> complexity. So uh, the floor is yours, Gökçe. Thank you very much for having me. Having it's, me. A it's a pleasure, pleasure to be here and to also see all your wonderful drawings. Today, I'm mainly the, the talk is mainly going to draw on my uh, book Spaceship in the Desert, but um, I'm not going to summarize the book in full, but rather give you a glimpse of some of the arguments I make in the book. And in concluding, I also want to share some uh, brief remarks on my current uh, research project on uh, floating power plants. 
In the year 2006, the Abu Dhabi government publicized its intentions to invest in renewable energy and clean technology in the form of a, a multifaceted state-owned company called Mazdar. Um, and the hope was to ensure that the Emirates remains a significant player in the energy industry while well after its oil reserves run dry or become less valuable. So in the following years, Mazdar, which means source in Arabic, became widely known for Mazdar City, a futuristic, smart eco-city that was designed by the London-based architecture office, Foster & Partners, to rely entirely on renewable energies. Mazdar City would house 50,000 residents and 40,000 commuters on a 600-hectare area and cost $22 billion. Uh, the site that you see here in the rendering uh, neighbored the Abu Dhabi International Airport, the Yas Marina Formula One circuit, and the Al Ghazal golf course. To look at computer generated images of it, you might think it was a fantasy from a sci fi comic, the sort I read as a boy, Norman Foster of Foster and Partners said in 2011. But Mazdar City, a university city and an environmental technology park outside Abu Dhabi, is already being built. So here you can see the computer rendering of the Mazdar City master plan, which was heavily publicized in the period between 2007 and 2011. While the EcoCity was central to Mazdar's vision, Mazdar also invested in renewable energy via its other operations, Mazdar Power, Mazdar Carbon, and Mazdar Capital. Mazdar Institute, uh, which is the renewable energy research center founded by MIT, was opened inside the fledgling EcoCity, and, um, and it started offering fully funded graduate degrees to about 200 students from around the world. So during the time of the sort of the, my field work um, in 2010 and 2011, these students were the only inhabitants of Mazdar City living in dormitories on campus. And uh, here in this image, you can see the Mazdar Institute dorms and labs situated at the center of Mazdar City. My book, Spaceship in the Desert Maps and Analyzes the Production of Abu Dhabi's Renewable Energy and Clean Technology Infrastructures and Centers on the Mazdar Project, seeking to understand how an oil-rich country like the United Arab Emirates prepares for a future with less oil. So I can talk more about the book during the Q&A, but in the rest of this presentation, I'd like to analyze the imagery employed in speaking about the futuristic Mazdar City project uh, in the years that followed its launch. So why and how did Mazdar become conceptualized as a city of the future? And what did it mean for the project to be located at an other time, in addition to being located within a bounded area in the desert, often conceptualized as an other space? What or perhaps when was the future imagined through Mazdar City? A celebrated commentary regarding the futuristic aspects of Mazdar City came from Laura's blog, where she emphasized how being there felt like living in a spaceship in the middle of the desert. Laura was an American student in her mid-20s, and she had moved to Abu Dhabi from the U.S. with an ambition to learn about renewable energy and clean technology at the new Mazdar Institute. And she held a, a bachelor's degree from a, uh, in engineering from a small college in Massachusetts. In September 2010, after publishing uh, this blog entry that you see here, uh, Laura received unexpected attention from journalists around the world. The president of Mazdar Institute and many other media like the Guardian newspaper uh, recalled Laura's blog when reporting on developments at Mazdar. Laura had a studio apartment on the new campus and had assumed the blog would only reach a handful of friends and family members. So she later searched for reasons as to why and how, how it had become so popular. Since the 1960s, space travel technologies have inspired ecologically sensitive architecture, producing a blueprint for survival in the context of rising environmental concerns. As historians of science, such as Peder Anker and Sabine Höhler have noted in their overviews of ecological design developments, the American space program of the 1960s had considerable impact on how designers imagined and planned eco-friendly life on Earth. Buildings would constitute self-regulating and decentralized systems with comfortable climatic conditions for humans. They would provide enclosed shelters for an impending ecological disaster, and they would serve as means of escape from possible destruction on Earth. And this is perhaps best symbolized by the well-known Biosphere 2 project, where in the fall of 1991, eight scientists entered uh, this uh, glass and steel complex uh, that you see in the image here, in the Sonoran Desert in Oracle, Arizona, about an hour outside Tucson, to test whether they could sustain their lives in a sealed environment. 
and the hope was that the model would someday be replicated to colonize outer space. Occupying buildings inspired by space technologies, humanity would behave like astronauts with clear outer space missions. In these histories, the spaceship is a finite, technically sophisticated and insular habitat for an exclusive group of beings facing an outside world of crises. In his book, Shipwreck with Spectator, Hans Blumenberg explains how humans prefer in their imagination to represent their overall condition in the world in terms of a sea voyage. The idea of the spaceship, that much like the submarine that preceded it, then serves as an extension of the arc metaphor, demonstrating the inevitable boundaries of human activities, vilifying the space beyond human habitability, and producing the outside as a vacuum that should not be inhabited. As seas full of mythical monsters surrounded livable environments on Earth, the ship provides a safe interior space thanks to its strict boundaries. Or as the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk suggests, it acts as an autonomous, absolute, context-free house the building with no neighborhood. This way, the ship puts forward an alternative environment of peace and rationality, standing in opposition to the destructive and irrational crises of Earth. In prioritizing enclosure for some over collective survival, which is uh, the tension that underpins most spacefaring movies, the spaceship also advances the principles of selection and endorses what Sloterdijk calls exclusivity dressed up as universalism. Despite saving only a very small number of those who suffer a metaphorical shipwreck, the spaceship insists on addressing the planetary scale questions of survival in the unknown, the sustenance of the species beyond ecological catastrophe, and the preservation of an existing civilization, albeit in highly limited and confined form. Mazdar City was conceived to perform the role of a spaceship in the desert, to maintain the lives and livelihoods of its residents by relying on renewable energy and clean technology. Architects working with Foster and Partners based at Mazdar City site to monitor both the design of Mazdar Institute and the sustenance of, Mazdar City, of the Mazdar City Master Plan suggested that the ecological mandate assisted Norman Foster as he produced his legacy, having himself been inspired by the history of ecological architecture in the 1960s and 1970s. One of the on-site Foster and Partners architects told me, Norman wants to be the Bucky Fuller of this century. So Buckminster Fuller was a multidimensional, somewhat eccentric 20th century inventor who attempted to resolve the global problems of housing, transport, and education through his innovative design and writing projects. He conceived of the Earth as a beautifully designed spaceship that lacks comprehensible instructions, which he sought to provide in publishing in 1969, Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. We're all astronauts in Fuller's assertion. We've not been seeing our spaceship Earth as an integrally designed machine, which to be persistently successful must be comprehended and serviced in total. Earth was an operable technological object fully accessible to humankind. Fuller not only wrote about his technocratic understandings of Earth, but also conceived many design and engineering projects to illustrate his philosophy, such as uh, the geodesic dome, a lattice and shell structure that's, that can withstand a very heavy load for its size. As a young architect, Norman Foster met Buckminster Fuller in 1971 to collaborate on the construction of the Samuel Becker Theater at Oxford. The theater, which was never built, marked the beginning of their 12-year relationship, which involved several more collaborative uh, projects that would never be material, materially realized. The theater would have been a subterranean building designed to house classrooms and exhibition spaces for St. Peter's College, and it would have utilized the geodesic lightweight structures that had made Fuller famous by them. And this is a yeah, second image of the theater building. Foster claims this plan had a significant impact on the later stages of his own career. I remember that Bucky made the comparison with a submarine because the structure of the building had to be resistant to water, like a seaworthy vessel. The building had to stand up to the groundwater and other natural forces. So it's no coincidence that my later underground projects also take the form of ships and submarines. The metaphor of the ship or the submarine continues to inform Foster's design work. For instance, a 2009 article in The Guardian suggested that Foster's reassuringly technical, graceful, silver, white, and immaculate designs would be suitable for architecture on the moon. More recently, in 2015, 
Foster and Partners publicized renderings for a settlement on Mars, which would be constructed by robots prior to the arrival of humans. Designing for extraterrestrial environments provides an exciting platform for experimentation that's at the front line of innovative technology, one of Foster's partners commented to the Daily Mail. In relation to his recent designs for outer space, Foster has noted that he understands practicing architecture in the Arabian Gulf to be similar to lunar exploration. And news and commentators have supported this take on their, in their continued fascination with the idea of constructing an eco-friendly city in the desert. The inhospitable terrain suggests that the only way to survive here is with the maximum of technological support, a bit like living on the moon. In his autobiography, the leading Emirati entrepreneur and businessman Isa El Gurg asserts that Emirati rulers also understand the desert as a moonscape. He describes how Sheikh Rashid of Dubai dismissed the moon landing as a hoax, arguing that the pictures from the moon's surface on television had obviously been filmed in the mountains of Ras al Khaimah, one of the seven emirates that make up the UAE, specifically to delude fools like him. In December 2010, Mohamed Zadeh, then president of Mazdar Institute, appeared in a CNN documentary by Richard Quest about Mazdar City. He explained that when the US wanted to send a man to the moon, it produced NASA. Now, when the UAE wants to transform and diversify its economy, it builds Mazdar City. How can we understand and conceptualize the impetus to compare Mazdar City with the moon landing or with an exploratory trip to outer space? Looking back at the Apollo space program, David Mindell, a historian of science at MIT, explains how President John F. Kennedy seized and mobilized the powerful mythology of the frontier in aiming for the moon. The term frontier, originally meaning border or borderline, took on new resonance during the settlement of the American West in the 18th and 19th centuries. In this narrative, heroic pioneers headed to an unknown geography full of unpredictable dangers. There, they would make use of self-control and self-reliance to open up a new resource frontier. Laura's spaceship analogy also helped the producers of Mazdar City in promoting the reconfiguration of the desert as an undiscovered resource frontier from which a novel means of livelihood would emerge. The analogy served as a conceptual extension of the multiple Orientalist projects that the British or the French undertook in the 19th century in order to make a certain form of life possible in the arid geographies of Arabia. Many colonialist and settler colonialist projects have regarded the desert as this blank or ruined space, which can be fixed with the help of technology and proper governance. In the new adventure, the frontiers people of Mazar City would be in charge, both abiding by the principles of the uh, UAE government and taking the initiative to produce a next generation of innovators. The frontier people would help Abu Dhabi ensure its survival after oil by substituting fossil fuels with renewable energies. According to this destiny, the students would take charge as astronauts, managing the successful institution of a new resource economy within an oil exporting country. The frontier narrative not only reconfigured the passengers of Mazdar City as resource pioneers, it also obfuscated the idea of resource finitude. While the Mazdar City project seemingly relied on and reproduced the acknowledgement that fossil fuels would eventually disappear, the Eco City promoted an infinity of sunlight and wind in responding to this verdict. Perhaps fossil fuels were going to be less abundant, but this did not mean energy sources were finite and predetermined. Detached from the burdens of nature, spaceship in the desert would journey through endless space, confirming the vision of a boundless frontier where new varieties of resources were soon to be discovered. In fulfilling its duties as an exploratory vehicle into outer space, the Mazdar City project would challenge and resolve the problem of finitude. In its revised formula, uh, Mazdar would constitute a testbed for multiple energy technologies that might later be purchased and used around the world. On top of this, Mazdar City as a whole would be conceived as an exportable commodity, leading to the production of its replicas around the globe. The Mazdar City design had to be mobile, traveling throughout the world. The Eco City served as a technologically advanced spaceship that could survive in a vacuum. Moreover, it had the potential to further spread that technologically advanced environment in an undefined space and time. 
In other words, Mazdar conveyed and emanated the promise to create that space and time for everyone else. Meanwhile, Mazdar Institute students, the frontier people of Abu Dhabi's emergent ecocity experiment, remained unsure about the translatability of Mazdar City into other settings. On February 1st, 2011, they gathered in the Mazdar Institute Auditorium to debate whether Mazdar City is an elite enclave of sustainability unsuitable for the rest of the world. The graduate students who came to Mazdar City from countries including the US, China, India, Egypt, Jordan, Iran, Turkey, and Iceland were struggling with such questions and wished to think about them in the context of a debate club performance. The team that perceived Mazdar City as an elite enclave of sustainability argued that Mazdar was too unique to be applied elsewhere. For one, Mazdar was very expensive. Which other country other than the oil-rich UAE would be able to devote $22 billion for an eco-city? Second, they recalled how this project had been put together to contribute to the economic diversification of Abu Dhabi and perhaps would not be financially feasible or meaningful for other countries with different economies. Mazdar City was expected to help the UAE transform its brand image from oil producer to technology developer to induce a perception shift, possibly attracting foreign investments or facilitating the creation of local startups focusing on clean technology. Third, the political climate of Abu Dhabi was working in favor of Mazdar City by providing prolonged commitment and stability. The government often served as a steady source of financing for the project. In this understanding, Mazdar City would remain an island contingent on a specific set of circumstances only available within the UAE. Abu Dhabi's oil capital, its future economic vision, and its political environment were thus perceived as preconditions for launching the spaceship. In response, the team that defended the global applicability of Mazdar City proposed that the eco city should be understood and framed as a prototype. Abu Dhabi would shoulder the burdens of building the eco-city and others would benefit. Every new idea is expensive, one of the students underlined. Think about the car. First rich people had it and now it's spread all around the world. Mazdar City could become less expensive in an undefined future. It could be exported to other countries as a whole in the same way that the car and its infrastructures have been exported. In the meantime, the experiments taking place at Mazdar would be learning experiences for students, researchers, and faculty, opening up global horizons for research on renewable energy. At the end of the meeting, one student approached me to express his dissatisfaction at how none of the students on the debate teams had actually defined what Mazdar City was or what exactly they expected it to spread around the world. No one talked about the personal rapid transit units or the motion sensors he specified, pointed to the technological artifacts that seemingly defined the eco-city for him. What would Mazdar City pass on to the rest of the world, he wondered? And what exactly was the future that the spaceship promised? On November 10th, 2010, some weeks before the official opening of Mazdar City, Daniel, a Foster and Partners architect overseeing the master plan, gave a talk about their design process. The students who organized the debate were in the audience. Daniel's slideshow included a lo this lunar image juxtaposing a space module with the gray lightweight cladding of the laboratory buildings on the Mazdar Institute campus. The laboratory facades were composed of insulating cushions that the architects explained shade the interiors of the building and remain cool to the touch under the desert sun. Yet while the technological infrastructure of Mazdar City was critical to the project, the architects also emphasized how they learned from old Arab cities in designing the eco-city. Daniel's slideshow in fact began with references to cities that had architectural principles akin to Mazdar. Aleppo in Syria, Marrakesh and Morocco were among the cities that inspired the city's master plan, along with traditional districts within Abu Dhabi, Dubai and other cities in the UAE and Gulf region. Many of these cities also had narrow streets, shaded windows, courtyards, and wind towers. The audience, mainly Mazdar Institute students and researchers, listened carefully and examined the image that Daniel showed, a bird's eye view of Shibam in Yemen taken by George Steinmetz, a National Geographic photographer. A student raised his hand to ask a question, interrupting the presentation. But does Shibam really exist? Have you ever seen it? Daniel replied that it was too dangerous to travel to Yemen these days, so he'd never been to Shibam, and added how he would love to go there someday. But sure, Shibam existed. 
the city or this historical artifact, as Daniel framed it, had been one of the primary inspirations for building Mustar City, an eco city that strove to be located in the future and that had its roots in a uniquely Arab past. By using representations of Shibam and other older Arab cities in, in these presentations, the designers of Mazdar City looked for a context to which Mazdar City could respond. At the same time, however, they helped serve political goals, assisting Abu Dhabi in achieving a centrality in the Arab world. In their presentation, Daniel and his fellow architects working with Foster and Partners employed references to the past as material evidence and reasoning to thereby attain solid historical grounding for their project. By depicting their sources of inspiration, the designers of Mazdar City formulated a credible trajectory for the emergent master plan and positioned it as a natural conclusion to the urban developments in different parts of the Arab world. This imagery did not necessarily claim to be apolitical. Instead, by referencing, reproducing, and advancing this trajectory, Abu Dhabi acquired additional critical weight within the Arab world, constituting a new cultural crossroads. In these presentations, the old city of Shibam lost its social, political, and even material qualities and became part of the imaginary world of Mazdar City. Did Shibam really exist? No one in the audience, including the architects, seemed to have experienced Shibam firsthand. Seen in a bird's eye view photograph in the Foster and Partners slideshow, Shibam's qualities complemented those of Mazdar. Shibam stood in for a mythical Arab past, relegated to lost history and unapproachable geography. In this context, Mazar City not only served as, a material, as the materialization of a displaced longing for this past, it also epitomized the expectations for a mythical Arab future under construction in Abu Dhabi. The official opening of the Mazdar Institute campus, perhaps a metonymical representation of Mazdar City, was scheduled for November 23, 2010. The campus, which contained laboratories, residential units, classrooms, a cafeteria, a coffee shop, a small gym, and a knowledge center, as well as open landscaped areas between these facilities, was argued to be the first structure of its kind to be powered by solar energy. When the day of the inauguration ceremony came, the students had important roles to play in it. And here you can see some students posing with Norman Foster and uh, then the president and uh, first lady of Iceland. A day before the event, all of the, students, all of the students received an email attachment with instructions on where they would be stationed throughout the ceremony and how they would approach the high profile visitors to the building, such as uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin uh, Zayed Al Nahyan, then Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. The document specified, you need to identify yourselves and greet the guests by saying, thank you for coming to Mazdar Institute inauguration. We're delighted to have you here. We will show you to the PRT cars. While six students were to welcome visitors at the Person Rapid Transit Station, 14 others were asked to be present at the Knowledge Center, reading, working on laptops, checking books at the first floor of the library, so as to allow the visitors to experience the building in operation. The remaining 100 or so students would be stationed at different locations on campus at different times. The students were provided with a fact sheet with answers to questions such as what makes Mustard City special, as well as reference points for their potential conversations with guests. They would redeploy Mustard's marketing campaigns, this time through informal conversations, while making use of half working material artifacts on site as props. What they staged would serve as a natural representation of the future of Mustard Institute that busy students absorbed in their work reading, working on laptops, checking books at the first floor of the library. When presenting the Institute somehow made more sense to introduce that abstract future rather than showcasing the current state of indeterminacy the fledgling institution was trying to overcome. In this performance, the students did not only pretend to exist in the future, they also demonstrated the perpetual potential of the project. The science fiction or utopia that Mazdar Institute represented was further enacted and confirmed through high profile visits to campus. By relying on a predetermined statement about the campus, the marketing department employees introduced different research projects on site to their guests, which ranged from Hollywood celebrities such as Adrian Brody and James Cameron to politicians such as then US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to investors interested in building eco hotel chains or organic grocery stores. 
these visits not only helped showcase the multiple advancements on clean technology, but also supported publicity campaigns in national and international media outlets. When the movie star Clive Owen toured the Mazdar Institute, for instance, his comments ran under the headline, Mazdar looks like a city from the future in the national English language newspaper, Khalij Times. Owen, who had starred in acclaimed science fiction films such as Children of Men from 2006, suggested that a science fiction film be shot at the Institute. Many others saw the marketing and communications campaigns as portraying a science fiction project. In describing the city, many refer to films, films such as The Fifth Element, Total Recall, or Blade Runner. Margaret Atwood's recent novel, Oryx and the Craig from 2003, was also considered a good analog. Most of these works are set in bounded cityscapes where life is impossible outside technologically supported zones. Soon, Mazdar's promoters forecast life would need to be sequestered in enclosed and self-sufficient spaces due to climate change and energy deficiency. As a city built from scratch, Mazdar offered a vision of technologically complex, eco-friendly and enjoyable modes of living and aimed to serve as a potential engine for economic growth. But the future that animated in this complex was at times dark. By the logic of Mazdar's marketing campaign, the time and space of Mazdar city was at once apocalyptic and utopian. Indeed, when executives working with Mazdar City utilize analogies based in science fiction narratives, they receive tongue in cheek criticism from reviewers. An environmental news website quipped Mazdar City is bringing Blade Runner to the fore. No one wants to live in a city full of replicants, even if it's eco friendly. Someone better call Deckard to fix this mess before it gets out of hand. The news website pointed out that many works of science fiction are critiques of totalizing environments where corporate power looms large, the police seem omnipresent, and large-scale social problems remain inevitable despite extensive rational planning. At the same time, Blade Runner signified the future that had already passed. Mazdar City was relying on and reproducing an imaginary of the future dating back as far as the 1960s. It was not necessarily generating the fresh and innovative futures marketers promised. Anyhow, when they stop building it and they finally give up on the clean technology cluster, Mazdar City will probably transform into an amusement park, don't you think? Selim, a Mazdar Institute student, wondered aloud. He was referring to spaces that were originally conceived of as futuristic communities, but later abandoned to constitute objects of amusement, most famously Walt Disney's Epcot Center planned for 20,000 residents on a plot of land in Orlando, Florida, which became the site of the theme park Epcot after his death. According to Selim, in a few decades, people would come and visit the ruins of an eco city, or what was meant to be an eco city, where the ruins would signify not only decay, but also traces of an idea once pursued ambitiously. In this imagined future, Mazdar city would become more of a spectacle and its ruin would once again offer entertainment to its spectators, in addition to nostalgia for a past where the option of a renewable energy future was still available. Yet the specter of ruination denoted how technological solutions are always so close to complete breakdown, as opposed to indeterminate potential. These narratives were very significant in shaping Mazdar, but Let's take a quick look at how exactly the spaceship gets fueled. In this image here, you can see the beam down concentrated solar power station, which was a collaborative project carried out by MIT and Mazdar Institute researchers inside Mazdar City. So as, and as some of you may know, Abu Dhabi is perceived to be a perfect location for harnessing solar energy. However, according to Mahmoud, a 30-something Egyptian-born engineer at Mazdar, this perception was not completely accurate. Upon finishing his PhD at an American university and wishing to be closer to home, Mahmoud had accepted a position at Mazdar as his first job. As we chatted outside the solar power station, he stated that high levels of dust and humidity were blocking direct solar rays and causing thick coatings on the solar panels, diminishing their effective functioning. Although we can't fix this problem that easily, we found a solution for it, he continued. We call it a man with a brush. And here you can see uh, the man with a brush and you can see the Mazdar Institute buildings at the back there. 
In Mahmoud's understanding, the man with a brush, a worker dedicated to gently wiping away dust and mud from the solar panels, became part of the picture only to reveal the infrastructural potential embedded within the solar panels. Man with a brush could perform a feat that extensive technological innovation couldn't so far handle, and therefore was fundamental to the emergent renewable energy sector of Abu Dhabi. The man with a brush was South Asian, or perhaps from the Philippines, and he shared a room with other workers in a labor camp outside Abu Dhabi, and he walked around the Mazdar city site cleaning solar panels on a daily basis. Overall, the immigrant labor force served as a most effective and essential resource for the materialization and functioning of renewable energy and clean technology infrastructure in the UAE. Yet these humans who were making the infrastructures work were most often perceived as disposable tools. Mazdar City attempted to help humanity fight climate change and energy scarcity problems, but its understanding of humanity was particular and selective. It did not include the man with the brush. At Mazdar City, oil would cease to be the main currency. Driverless electric pods would replace cars, and eventually possible environmental problems would be avoided through meticulous research and technological discovery. Relayed as a science fiction style narrative, the political and social justices did not seem to matter much. So as I've explained in this talk, so far I've studied the emergence of new energy infrastructure in the Arabian Peninsula, examining how oil-rich economies prepare for a future with less oil. So in my next book project, I flip this question around and I ask how countries that suffer from electricity shortages satisfy urgent power demands. And rather than focusing on high-tech solutions, I investigate the quick and provisional energy infrastructures they employ. So, and in addressing urgent electricity demands, many countries are looking toward quick power generation systems. And one emerging system is power ships, floating power plants that anchor in a harbor, plug into a national grid, and generate electricity with heavy fuel oil or natural gas. And here you see Ostwandran, which is uh, one of the largest uh, power, power ships that are producing electricity today. The Turkish company Karadeniz Holding, or Car Power, as it's known to many of its customers, has become an increasingly prominent producer of power ships in the past decade. A family-owned business, Car Power builds the ships on spec in various shipyards in Istanbul and leases them to places with high energy demands. Its barge, Ayşe Sultan, anchored in the Tema Fishing Harbor in Ghana and produced power for the country's grid between, 2000, between December 2015 and September 2017 initiating the company's operations in Africa. The larger power, sh power ship Osman Khan, which you see here in the image, replaced Ayşe Gibi Sultan in late 2017, almost doubling car power's production volume. In an effort to switch its fuel source from heavy fuel oil to natural gas, which is a less expensive and more environmentally friendly fuel, Osman Khan moved in late 2019 from Tema to Takoradi, a port much closer to Ghana's natural gas reservoirs. Power ships illustrate a shift from what energy companies have called permanent power to temporary power, although this binary admittedly doesn't reflect the complexities of the transformation. A 2014 article in Power, which is the go-to trade periodical that's been published in North America since the late 19th century, asked, when temporary power supplies nearly a quarter of a grid demand, is it still temporary power? How about when a project lasts 10 years? The article continued, Calling power service temporary doesn't quite capture all of its distinguishing attributes. It's temporary rather than permanent, rented rather than owned, and mobile rather than fixed. It's also modular and easily scalable. Others in the industry have argued that temporary power stations are compelling due to their low upfront capital requirements and rapid installation. In a context where uh, various forms of temporary power have gained popularity, Power ships differentiated themselves from competitors through their formal qualities, namely by being ships which can move from sites of production to sites of consumption, utilizing a seascape, relatively independent of logistics networks. Unlike other systems of power generation, the construction of power ships was undertaken in a completely different environment than the one in which the floating plant will function. By centralizing production in shipyards in Istanbul, the company controlled its oper operations efficiently. Power ships did not require large, site, large sites, making the projects more desirable for leasing countries. 
Once they arrived at the harbor, the only supplement the power ship necessitated was high frequency cables that connected the ship to the nearest substation. In the case of Temagana, for instance, the substation was nine kilometers away. Finally, since their only connection to the land was through uh, the high frequency cables that you see in this image, power ships also seemed more tenuous than land-based plants, giving the appearance that the ship could leave any time, especially if and when their presence in the leasing countries no longer made financial or political sense. As a temporary and market-based system, power ships don't offer teleological narratives about progress. In contrast, uh, histo uh, historian St Stephen Misher shows how Ghana's Akosombo Dam hydroelectric power station, also known as the Volta Dam, produced different temporalities of an industrial future that would transform the country's rural past and create new cities, factories, and infrastructures during the 50s and the 60s. At the dam's inauguration ceremony in January 1966, Kwame Nkrumah, who was the first president of independent Ghana and a pan-African statesman, announced, it's in the spirit of fruitful collaboration for a better world that I inaugurate the Volta River project. Let us dedicate it to Africa's progress and prosperity. Only in this way will Africa play its full part in the achievement of world peace and for the advancement of the happiness of mankind. Nkrumah was overthrown by a military coup a, a few months after the ceremony. The future envisioned by Nkrumah, in which each would give according to his ability and receive according to his needs, as the literary scholar uh, Saidia Hartman observed, had been eclipsed. Inadequate rainfall and rising temperatures associated with climate change have negatively impacted the hydroelectric power station at Lake Volta, at times completely incapacitating it. At a time when power demand was increasing across the country, the dams could no longer satisfy national electricity needs. Between the years 2012 and 15, an electricity crisis resulted in unprecedented levels of load shedding throughout Ghana. Power for industries and homes was out for 24 hours at a time and turned back on for only 12 hour periods. Dumsor, the name given to the crisis that means off and on in Twi, was brought about by lower water levels in hydroelectric dams due to the climate change, disruptions to natural gas from Nigeria, and alleged mismanagement of the grid infrastructure. In response, Ghanaian decision makers saw a further expansion and diversification of the country's energy portfolio as a possible solution to the crisis, shifting the nation's energy production portfolio further away from hydropower and towards fossil fuels. Most of the new power producers that started operating in Ghana since the early 2000s have been thermal stations that rely on natural gas, stockpile light crude oil, and burn heavy fuel oil. Unlike Nkrumah introducing the Akosombo Dam, such new power producers such as the floating power plant uh, have not offered future-oriented narratives about social or political progress, but rather quick stopgap solutions that provide immediate relief to consumers bridging electricity shortages. In developing this work on power ships, I conduct research with decision makers from the electricity industry in Ghana. And I've also met with company representatives, um, company executives and staff from Car Power in Turkey, Ghana, and Lebanon between 2016 and 2020. And in addition to visiting company headquarters in Istanbul, I've spent time on the ship in Ghana. And here's an image from inside the power ship. And this is the chief engineer of the ship telling me about uh, the exhaust system pictured here. In 2018, I also attended a diplomatic trip to Algeria, Senegal, and Mauritania with the Turkish uh, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his entourage. And this diplomatic trip offered many opportunities to discuss floating power plants with business people and government representatives during four intensive days. And let me also contextualize power ships within uh, the growing Turkey-Africa relationship. And here you can see my fellow travelers and I in Mauritania out, outside the airport. So our current era uh, is marked by contingencies that force us to question dominant modes of thinking about the world and to seek novel ways of attending to climate change and impending energy issues. In Spaceship in the Desert in particular, I show how the green urban infrastructure of Mazar City fueled an aspiration for the manageability of ecological problems, where business models and design solutions were thought to resolve climate change without surrounding hope for increasing productivity and technological complexity. The 
green products tested on site were instrumental for economic diversification in the UAE, generating a new brand image. Yet these products also strengthen the boundaries between the haves and the have-nots upon whom the former's lives are predicated. An adequate response to climate or urban response to climate change will require a somewhat less fun and optimistic, but ultimately more inclusive understanding of our collective futures. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Gokce. I hope you are hearing that applause. The disadvantage of Zoom is that you can't hear probably all the all the hundred people who are right now online and and applauding. It was it was really wonderful to to see that. And uh, I am uh, I am very impressed. I have to say, and uh, and um, uh, by by the kind of um, um, architectural point of view, let's say, you know, to, to what extent you engage really with architecture, with the sort of culture, you know, corporate culture of, of architecture and how you uh, kind of deconstruct it. And then you also engage with those imaginaries that operate in those contexts. So I think Norman Foster was, I think, uh, <laughs> I haven't really seen an architect who was brave enough to, to engage, let's say, critically with, with, the, with the figure of Norman Foster. So I found this really, really super exciting. And uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are so many, so many questions that um, we could, we could uh, uh, have a long, uh, long conversation. I mean, uh, uh, many topics that uh, that are foregrounded. Um, I am. I can comment. I mean, I'm personally impressed how you use this metaphor of uh, of a spaceship, right? And and discuss to to discuss um, uh, the way technology operates as a, as a, as a commodity, essentially in in sort of you know being traded among among uh, um you know different different governments different projects so as you described master city itself is a, is a product it's an it's an urban technology right of you know that 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 is meant to be uh um um spread let's say in a in a, in a sort of a uh, i i would say in a, in a kind of very very colonialist uh, uh, um um uh, i think mentality behind it and then also to see how ghana you know shifts from from hydro uh let's say back or or sort of embraces the fossil fuel paradigm as a kind of a motor of of urbanization is really and then also the the ship which again ties back to the to the metaphor of the spaceship it's it's uh, um uh it's really um um let's say it, it's an it's an urgent theme you know for for us right and i uh i wonder you know, I wonder where, where, uh, where do you, where do you see? I mean, you you have engaged with architecture so much. I mean, maybe I can ask you a very general question that that is kind of pedagogical for the students. Where, where do you see the the possibility for architects' engagement in this field? Uh, you know, like a kind of critical engagement. No, like have you have you have you seen? Uh, 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 practices or or um, uh, have you seen uh, let's say master uh, uh, practices that that uh, engage uh, uh, critically or a different way with the with the energy uh, production in that context that, that's a great question i so many of the critical uh practices i guess that a respond to these kinds of questions uh, are not necessarily building buildings, but that are that yeah. they're producing drawings that a kind of uh, I think try to sort of uh, maybe uh, show the kind of ironies uh, embedded in these kinds of projects, uh, and I think uh, it becomes harder to sort of. Uh, harder for architects to respond to these challenges when they start trying to 
build projects and start negotiating with the with the range of developers mm -hmm. and uh, government representatives and uh, you know uh, and all kinds of parties that are part of the production of uh, mm -hmm. of, of of a building. So 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 I think uh, obviously the grand future that I described here with the Mazdar City project is. I think relatively unique that not, not every building project comes with the kind of imagination that mm -hmm. was kind of projected onto uh, something like Bazdar City. Mm -hmm. And and now we're seeing, I guess, another example of it, uh, again, emerging from the Gulf, uh, the project, uh, the Saudi project, Neon, which is also kind of generating the same kind the, of the long, the long, uh, the, the line, the, the, the line. linear city. Yeah. Yeah, and it's also generating a similar kind of hype. Uh, uh, again, pa that parallels some of the hype that Ma the Mazdar City project generated in the early two thousands, and um, and I and I wonder uh, how and to what extent uh, these the, our fascination with these kinds of projects today is also kind of uh, stems from a kind of nostalgia with the 1950s, 1960s sort of modernist projects uh, mm -hmm. that claim that architecture could solve all of the mm -hmm. world's problems. I mean, if you think about examples like Brasilia, for instance, uh, that were projects that would perhaps uh, sort of generate a different kind of maybe a more equitable future, but nevertheless, uh, mm -hmm. the the sort of the insistence on architecture as being the key to mm -hmm. resolving um, resolving social and political economic issues mm -hmm. is, is perhaps echoed in all of these projects. Um, yeah, so so, that, so I think there's something to say about maybe architects understanding uh, that architecture operates with alongside other kinds of social and political dynamics that in itself architecture is not, uh, is not um, cannot necessarily reorganize all social dynamics and all sort of um, uh, uh, old political sort of uh, issues uh, in itself. So maybe that acknowledgement is a good place to start for uh, for for designers, um, and then and and then also to sort of see, um, yeah, to see what those forces are that architecture operates together with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, the the technology itself is uh, is um, is is a force which introduces a certain inertia, right? And I uh, um, I uh, I wonder to to what extent the the you know I think technology with its with its specific mindset with its specific relationship to the future with its sort of images narratives that it's that are embedded with within that right so this this kind of biosphere or, or other imaginaries of the of the of the moon and of that kind of complete um let's say independence from the earth right so it's a very promethean very you know it is really a kind of another world that this technology is building you know and this is this is interesting so when you show the man with the brush right <laughs> mm -hmm. of course a brilliant uh, observation and that's somehow that is the, the the whole point i mean was there not a different path possible in approaching technology, in, in imagining a different end goals with technology, I think that uh, right now a lot of, I mean, you know, there, there are there are interesting researchers working on the kind of a, from the position of feminist critique in in various uh, sort of branches of technology, you know, robotics, um, I don't know, uh, um, uh, digital fabrication, and so on, and. Um, you know, the suggestion in this discussion is that we should, in fact, imagine very different technologies, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, that that uh, uh, that have a different sort of mindset in um, projecting that future goal, right? So there's something else should be imagined, and then a new technologies should be built in order to to realize that different future 
what, what, what do you think about that? I'm, I'm curious to what extent are, are you part of those, uh, let's say, science and technology debates, the, the kind of feminist critiques and so on? What, what do you see in that, in that field as a kind of a interesting conversations? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the, I, I follow some of the discussions that you've mentioned, and I think the ones that are most uh, sort of uh, interesting to me these days are the conversations on maintenance and repair. So rather than seeing technology or or also it's just buildings themselves also uh, as technologies as things that just pop up and that just uh, remain uh, intact uh, without any kind of intervention for the course of lifetime to sort of see them as as spaces that are that are going to require uh, manless brushes that are going to sort of have the have have the sort of the other mm -hmm. kinds of other kinds of um you know that that will generate other kinds of relationships and what that what it mean what does it mean to sort of uh take into consideration the role of um maintenance and repair as as while imagining technologies or technological futures and i think partially uh, the sort of feminist science and technology studies thinks about sort of how the how the um, how the work of maintenance and repair is mostly done by um, done by uh, women, and and so that that is the sort of also the space from which uh, they ask the question of so, so okay so who does the designing and then who does the sort of the implementing and and then who does the sort of the maintenance and repair work so. So that that I think here I show sort of a more uh, sort of a class based critique of the same kind of uh, uh, conversation, but I think it definitely echoes the the questions that you were asking. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Gokchu. So you maybe are you able to see your chat? I see one question that comes from uh, Freck uh, uh, Persine, our our colleague, and I. I I think you know you know him uh, also, and and uh, Falma Fazi, uh, and so that those are those are good uh, good friends and collaborators. Would you would you be able to read that uh, question, or shall I shall I do that for uh, because if I move away from the mic, then nobody will hear me. Uh, yeah. So, do you see in your work on patchwork ethnography a possible model? And if you see, uh, if you, if, you, if so, can you say a few words on that? Yeah. Thank you so much for bring, bringing that up, actually, because the the model of the I think there's a, a very clear connection to here, which is about sort of how well in the the patchwork ethnography project stemmed from a sort of a question about sort of how. Um, Sort of um, thinking about um, how does sort of uh, the researchers' own subject position affect the pro production, pro affect the project of knowledge production? So, um, so in this case, the question was stemmed from the sort of the uh, the practice of ethnographic research. So, if uh, if an ethnographer is not necessarily the kind of the sorry. One Oh. Uh, so if an ethnographer is not is not necessarily the sort of again the archetype of the sort of the 20th century or 19th century ethnographer which is sort of a uh, white male who goes to the, the research in, a, in uh, somewhere far away uh, while his, his sort of partner takes care of his uh, children is if that's not the kind of the model that we're working with, then uh, what are the kinds of, uh, if you want to think about the discipline of anthropology or the practice of ethnography in a more inclusive way, then what are the kinds of ethnographic practices that stem from that? So if you're thinking about say people uh, who are with disabilities who are doing ethnographic projects or, or people with caring responsibilities, or people who don't have necessarily the financial resources to take off and leave for a year to practice sort of ethnographic work abroad for, uh, for an extended amount of time. So what then, where does that practice leave the project of ethnographic research? And so we came up with a model uh, of patchwork ethnography, which is about sort of uh, considering uh, the possibility of doing um, 
short uh, sort of visits to field sites uh, over many years and how the cumulative sort of the uh, knowledge generated from that might shape a different kind of writing practice. It also uh, asks what our research collaborations can look like in, uh, while we're doing field work. So I think the reason why it uh, resonates here is because um, once we published a piece called the Manifesto for Patchwork Ethnography, and once the piece was published, we received um, hundreds of emails from people around the world, and not necessarily who are practitioners of ethnographic research. Some of these people were architects dealing with the same kinds of uh, situation in their own uh, work practices. So, so then how do you... Um, how do I mean? Maybe it would be interesting to ask how does the sort of the uh, positionality of the designer here affect the kind of work that's that's produced and the, and the possibilities for that work. Um, so to echo and and the, the patchwork ethnography project stems very much from a sort of a feminist critique of ethnographic practice. So that feminist mm -hmm. critique could be very much used to sort of. Uh, Think about the uh, about the sort of design projects or about about technological production and themselves as well. So, um, so bringing in the sort of the full conditions of uh, production into the picture as your sort of, rather than sort of focusing so on the product itself in its entirety. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's the Thank that's you. what you were uh, asking about, but that was an inspiring yeah. question for me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And uh, we are uh, we are very much on a, on a similar track, I believe here at uh, at the Department of Architecture, there's a lot of exciting work going on. Uh, I mean, we also engage with the, let's say, uh, energy questions from, uh, I would say, the, the perspective of um, 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 somehow, um, I would say a kind of a humanizing perspective that democratizing the, the, the perspective of the man with the brush of the, <laughs> of the, of the let's say, uh, uh, care and maintenance and repair and so on and, and trying to, uh, to, to somehow approach, uh, 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 let's say, those, those uh, futures in a, in a kind of a, um, you know, with with the with the uh, tools of an architect. So uh, uh, it would be great, uh, Gokchen. and we will try to 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 keep you somehow close to us and in in some of those uh, conversations in the in the let's say beyond the applause and beyond the thank you. You know, we will we will uh, uh, share back some of some of the work that is inspired by your by your talk and by your writing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, thank you, Gökçe. Uh, and today we are, uh, now I will introduce the second grade of the exercise, which is uh, in a way uh, a take on Gökçe's terms, which she proposed for the concept game. It's called uh, my dot 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 post uh, oil urbanism. Uh, and before I go into the explanation of uh, what the exercise is about, I wanted to talk uh, about two articles writ written by Margaret Atwood. Uh, Gökçe was also uh, mentioning her. Uh, one of them she wrote in uh, 2009 for the Zeit. It's called Nachtam Öl, uh, and it was during the height of fracking and mining of tar sands in Canada, where uh, she is from. And also when people were uh, like uh, quite uh, heavily discussing peak oil. And the other one is called, it's not climate change, it's everything change. Uh, and she wrote it six years later. Uh, it includes the translation of the original piece and an added commentary. And it starts like this, the future without oil for optimists, a pleasant picture. Let's call it picture one. Shall we imagine it? There we are driving around in our cars fueled by hydrogen or methane or solar or something else we have yet to dream of. Goods from afar come to us by solar and sail driven ship. The sails computerized to catch every whiff of air or else by new versions of the airship, which can lift and carry a huge amount of freight with minimal pollution 
and no ear slitting noise. Trains have made a comeback. So have bicycles when it isn't snowing, but maybe there won't be any more winter. And she also has these uh, hilarious pictures in between. And she continues. We have gone back to small scale hydropower using fish friendly dams. We are eating locally and even growing organic vegetables on our erstwhile front lawns, watering them with gray water and rainwater and with the water saved from using low flush toilets, showers instead of baths, water saving washing machines and other appliances already on the market. We are using low draw light bulbs, incandescents have been banned and energy efficient heating systems, including pellet stoves, radiant panels and long underwear. Heat yourself, dot the room is no longer a slogan for naughty eccentrics. It's the way we all live now. So this isn't uh, at all uh, very unfamiliar right now. And uh, aside from this optimistic uh, future picture, she gives an account of a future in which peak oil arrives uh, very quickly. Everything comes to a halt, no cars, no planes, food ceases to flow into cities, water ceases to flow out of the taps. Within hours, panic sets in. And then comes picture three. In this picture, some countries plan for the future of diminished oil and some don't. The countries that plan for this future are the ones that don't have oil or don't need any oil, like Iceland generating over half of its uh, power from geothermal sources, or Germany attentively transitioning, or as Atwood says, preparing to weather the coming storm. And in the end, she asks, can we change our energy system? Can we change it fast enough to avoid being destroyed by it? Are we clever enough to come up with some viable plans? Do we have the political will to carry out such plans? Are we capable of thinking about long-term issues or like the lobster in a pot full of water that's being brought, to slow, brought slowly to the boil? Will we fail to realize the danger we are in until it's too late? There are many other places to look for such futures. Uh, and Gökçe was showing some earlier examples. Uh, they are also abundant now, uh, quite expectedly, of course, considering uh, the manifold planetary crisis that we are all in. It reflects on our imaginations, on our fabulations, narratives, and fictions. Uh, so here are some examples from climate fiction. Uh, let's say in the wind up girl, uh, it's set during contraction. This is uh, when the world runs out of fossil fuels. Uh, it's set in Bangkok, uh, which is under sea level and the desperate holding of the rising waters with uh, spring powered pumps. Then there is carbon diaries set in the UK after the great storm where the government imposes a 60% carbon tax. So people have to choose uh, what to use, uh, hair dryer or microwave, fridge or smartphone. And then there is uh, Transpersonish, uh, snow piercer as uh, more commonly known. It's uh, about uh, what happens in a train occupied by the rest of humanity after the attempt to stop global warming via Techno fixing ends up via techno fixing, which catastrophically backfires and creates a new ice age. And then again, Atwood uh, always says that everything she writes about is rather possible, and much of it has already happened. Uh, we have had our share of crises in the past, and we are also currently having them, and we also have certain ways to deal with them. Here you see some photos from 1973, the effects of oil crisis in Germany, which I just uh, actually saw in one of the presentations in our uh, review on Tuesday. On the left, you see a group of uh, people sitting in front of a tent on a highway on a car-free Sunday. And uh, next to it, you see two kids uh, riding their bikes across the empty highway on one of these Sundays. And today we keep uh, hearing about uh, other things uh, which are happening according, I mean, uh, due to the 
energy crisis that we are facing uh, in Europe and also uh, elsewhere. So uh, here is a piece from New York Times explaining how parkour athletes use their physical abilities to uh, jump and reach to these uh, lights and turn them off in nighttime Paris, which brings us to our second exercise. In this exercise, we would like to ask you to represent how you would envision the future to look like from the perspective of a post-oil urbanism. We first ask you to find a room with a view where you live in a place that feels familiar to you and take a chair and in, sit in front of this window and look outside. Observe what's happening for a while. What do you see? Vehicles, invisible infrastructures, lampposts, electrical wires, building facades, chimneys, vegetation, non-human animals, humans, the sky, the clouds, the sun. How do you relate what you see with energy? Extraction of materials, transportation of materials, production of energy, storage of energy, consumption of energy, and the necessary labor to do all of that. And of, of course, also its maintenance. How does energy form our urban landscapes? How does it alter our territories? And now imagine yourself sitting in the exact same spot, but decades later, what do you see now? Is this novel landscape one that is constructed after a just energy transition? Is this Atwood's picture one, or is it one of the other pictures? What changes do you notice? How is life different than before? What do we not do anymore? And what have we started doing in this imaginary future? How does energy form our urban landscapes and how does it alter our territories? So based on your imaginations of a post oil future, we ask you to illustrate how the view from your window would look like. What would you see when you're, not, when you're standing inside looking out through the window frame? Here are some inspirations. Uh, we start with Jan uh, Rothhuitsen's uh, Soft Atlas of Amsterdam. You see he uses uh, line drawings and a lot of uh, annotations that accompany the drawings, which uh, gives a lot of varied information about uh, what you're looking at. Uh, so if you spend more time looking into the drawing, uh, you will see there is uh, information about materials, but also past incidents, ongoing events, personal commands, etc. And uh, in this way, it's quite a uh, layered drawing and uh, gives uh, manifold, uh, let's say, inspirations. And then there is uh, Larissa Fassler's maps in which she visualizes the observable and intangible characteristics of uh, spaces. This one is called Koti, it's about Kotbusartor. Uh, she creates her cartographies by combining technical drawings, sketches, photos, uh, etc. And uh, these actually portrays tick and narrative cartographies of certain spaces, again, creating a very layered uh, information and the visualization. So in regards to these examples, your depiction of future could be a, a combination of these layers, line drawing, uh, photographs, technical drawing, sketches, annotations. And uh, just like last week, uh, we will send you a very detailed uh, explanation, the parameters, the examples, which I just showed the template and the deadline afterwards. These were the readings from Gökçe, and uh, these are the readings for our next session on uh, November 3rd after the seminar week. Thank you to everyone for listening and also to Gökçe.